Hey guys, welcome to this week's vlog by Health by Ratio, where we cover everything from injury prevention and rehabilitation to sports performance and the holistic approach on how to achieve our goals. So going back on to the topic we've covered the last couple of weeks, which are knee injuries in particular, we started off with talking about analysis of the uh, joints above and below. So how the ankles and how the hips impact specifically the knee valgus tendency for our knees to cave inward in relation to our feet and how that impacts us. If you guys haven't gotten a chance to check out our um, uh, our vlog from two weeks ago and you'll see that overview. Last week we took a look at your ankle mobility and how lack of dorsiflexion can cause us to need to cheat and for us to cave in again, um, creating that knee valgus. So how those ankles can impact us. And then we went over a series of techniques that you can begin to mobilize your ankles and start to uh, proprioceptively retrain the central nervous system to a certain degree on how to operate the ankle effectively while you're doing your main movement patterns like running and cutting and jumping. Now, this week's topic, we're going to be analyzing the hips. We're going to be taking a look at if we have any issues at the hip level, whether it's weaknesses or um, like mobility issues or stability issues, and give you a handful of techniques that you can do to um, get proper range of motion and strengthen you up. Now, next week, we're going to be going into protocols on um, proprioceptive training on a little bit more of a broader platform. Basically, proprioceptive training is specific exercises that are designed to retrain the central nervous system. This is how we got people like Claire, who is having chronic knee in, uh, pains, and um, people like Robert, who we spoke about, the skier, um, Claire, the volleyball player, Robert the skier last week who was having issues with um, recovering fully recovering from his ACL surgery how we got people like that back to not only feeling healthy not only just feeling like their their pains had diminished but actually making them feel like they could jump and explode and track down a ball or hit or spike or block without having any issues with the knee whatsoever and translating that into even more power or getting someone like Robert back onto the slopes where he could do what he loved and stay active during the winter um, while being able to keep his knee healthy. Um, these were, those are, um, the proprioceptive techniques are what retrain us functionally so that we maintain our um, posture while we are, or our alignment, I should say, while we are doing our athletic events. So that's gonna be next week. So first going into this week though, analyzing the hips and making sure that we are prioritizing everything that's going on above and below the knee that could be impacting our rehabilitation, our injury prevention, or our actual athletic performance. Um, this kind of work is what actually helped me myself. I personally went through an MCL meniscus injury in high school while I was playing football before I had access to functional mobility and retraining programs and functional um, exercise programs that um, kept my body into alignment. I had the issue of knee valgus. My knees went in and as an athlete who was running and jumping a lot, it took a toll on me until eventually somebody um, ended up rolling up into me. It wasn't a non-contact injury. Somebody hit me, but I, it shouldn't have been at an impact level that should have injured me. It would be considered a minor contact injury. And because of that, I, because of my imbalances and because of the micro traumas that built up, um, it has shown up in chronic patella tendinitis or tendinosis technically. Um, but chronic patellar pain for years and it eventually the thing that finally gave way was the mcl and meniscus so going into some analysis so you guys can see if your hips are potentially the issues are one a very simple test is what we call the single leg stance all you're going to do is get your feet pointed straight ahead if you remember from uh last week we talked about making sure your toes are dead straight ahead just because they feel straight doesn't mean they're straight so actually look down if you if you have any slant out to the side that doesn't count and then from there we are going to simply 
raise one leg up and try to hold this for at least 10 seconds without wobbling a significantly to one side or the other. So if you feel like you're barely keeping your balance or you can't keep your balance, there's a really good, um, that's a really good indication that you have something going on in the hips. Now, uh, some secondary tests that you can do to get a little bit more specific on whether it might have to do with more hip external rotation or hip internal rotation is if you grab a seat and you position yourself either directly in front of a camera where you can record yourself or just watching yourself in the mirror. Ideally, you want something that is about chair height. So I don't, these steps aren't perfect for me, but it's close enough. So chair height, and what you're going to do is cross one leg up over the other and naturally see how low you can get your knee. Can you get it to basically 90 degrees without pushing on it? and keeping an upright torso. You're gonna to feel tension on the outside of the hip, and then you would do that as well on the other leg. Then that's going to be testing the external rotation to see if you might be lacking. And what you're looking for is really, is there a difference from one side to the other? Do you have one side that's getting relatively low, and then do you have the other side that's relatively high? The other thing that you might see is just both are simply tight. Are you up at like a 45 degree angle or are you able to get this leg relatively low in relation to um, your hip? Then we're gonna go into the internal rotation. You start the same way. You're gonna go from your um, seated position. You wanna get your feet in line with each other. Cross the leg over and instead of focusing on the top leg, we're gonna still keep this upright torso and just use this top foot to kind of let the knee collapse inward. The goal is to see, can we get this knee to cross the midline without twisting yourself along your seat. So you're probably gonna wanna actually grab your chair and brace yourself because it's very common as you do this to have your whole body pivot and slide and that gets you to cheat. So you gotta make sure that the hips stay dead square and you're collapse, collapsing leg without actually rotating the hips or the shoulder girdle with it. Now, most people, especially with knee injuries, are gonna find that they're gonna have an imbalance more on the external rotation, the first one that you did, where you're crossing this way, versus the internal, because most of us naturally have that knee valgus tendency. Um, you can see this in pro athletes all over the place too. This is not something that's unique to just um, high school and college athletes or weekend warriors um, kind of thing in uh, adults in their 40s, 50s, and 60s. This is in our elite athletes. I, I talked to you guys in week one about Robert Griffin III and we analyzed his um, explosive squat pattern. Well, another case in point in this is Kevin Durant uh, uh, playing, well, used to be playing for the Golden State Warriors before that OKC. Now I believe he's uh, moved on to New York. And whenever you watch him shoot a free throw, watch him set up and he squats down before he goes and his knees literally cave into the inside. Well, before he actually, no, I believe it was with his first year with the Warriors, um, he sprained, which is a minor tear, his MCL. He injured his MCL. He had to miss a bunch of extra games. Well, that's because he has this knee valgus tendency. And you can see it every time he sets up for a free throw. He shakes his shoulders out. He shrugs his shoulders forward quite a bit. And his knees collapse forward. Both of those are postural deviations that result in an Unfortunately, one of the best basketball players in the game right now having to live and cope with chronic injuries on a regular basis. So this is something that happens to the best of us. And it's something, so don't feel guilty if you're feeling out of balance. We're going to try to give you some good mobility techniques now to begin to correct it. So the first thing that we want to do is open up in and around the hips. And I'm gonna give you a few different techniques here and kind of speed through them. If you remember from last week, essentially what you're trying to search for is any sharp pains. Any sharp pains or any pain itself is an indication in the muscle tissue as we're foam rolling that we have a um, knot that we are releasing and particularly a fascia knot, which is that second densest substance in the body next to bone. Um, just like Kelly Sturette said, uh, the pressure on t muscle tissue, normal pressure, shouldn't cause pain. So it's a good indication that we need to work an area. So the first area we're going to work through is the actual hip flexors, the psoas. This area of the body gets incredibly tight because 
most of us sit throughout the day, whether we're driving, whether we're sitting at work. If we are a student athlete, you're sitting at a desk for hours upon hours a day in class. And then when you're studying and doing homework and that kind of stuff, sitting is unfortunately a repetitive, long, long uh, a, a, a position that we put ourselves in for long periods of time. And so our hip flexors nod up and those hips uh, will end up being pulled out of alignment when we end up having um, really tight hip flexors, which impact the knees above and below. That's like what Gray Cook said. So we are exploring this by getting a softball sized ball, putting it at the hip level, um, and then working from the hip all the way up to the belly button. So we have about a six inch space or so that we're exploring around and trying to find any knotted up tissue. And then once we find those knots, we're breathing into it. This could take as little as one minute, uh, up to five minutes. Then we can bend the knee, kick that heel up into the air to e encourage some movement training that body, how to release, uh, stay relaxed, I should say, the, uh, keep this not relaxed while we are actually moving and not just in a passive state. That would be the hip flexor. That's the first one that we're I'm gonna search for and we're gonna do that on both sides. The next one we're gonna do is the outside of the hip, same level, but just on the outside of the hip. So I'm more sideways on this. This is the TFL area. So if you're having issues with your external rotation that we tested while sitting, this is an area that you're probably gonna have some tightness in. So you're working essentially anywhere from the front uh, 45 corner of your hip to the side of your butt. So you're working the meat around here, obviously not the side bone of your hip, but anywhere around there, we're exploring any knotted up tissue. Those are our first two areas. Now, the third area that we're gonna work on is gonna be the inner thigh, the AD ductors. This is also a huge one that has a ton of knots on us and what really impacts the knees because when you are collapsing inward, these inner thigh muscles, the AD ductors, are getting really, really overactivated. So how we can get this is using a foam roller. You could also do this with a ball. It's just a little bit more intense. I'm gonna move these out of the way. You're going to lay down and get your um, inside of your leg positioned on this foam roller. And you can explore this uh, uh, closer to the knee or closer to the hip. I wouldn't do the entire thing on one day. You can kind of break it up into different days. It'll take a long time. But you're exploring to see, do you have any significant knotted up tissues? Often for those of us that have had knee injuries, we're gonna experience a lot of tension and pains and knots right around the knee level. So we want to, again, breathe on the area. We can kind of point the toe more down toward the ground or more dead sideways, explore different angles. We can bend and flex the knee until we feel that release from that kind of sharp pain down to that dull ache. We can get now also the quad itself. Most of you who are have overcome like an ACL injury, for instance, have been told my quads are really weak. I got to strengthen my quads. Well, that that can be true to a certain extent, but often your quads end up getting really gunked up and knotted up into the process of this um, and end up becoming very overactive. And this was what was happening with Robert with his skiing was his quads were so overactive from above. And we talked about last week how it also his ankles impacted him, but his quads were so overactive and so gunked up from above he was putting constant tension on the ACL. So, the, and this was actually what happened with me with my patella tendinosis that I was experiencing throughout that ended up causing my MCL to go, was my quads were so gunked up that I, they weren't firing correctly and they were putting constant tension on the knee. So we're now basically in the same position as the AD doctor, except for my foot is fully turned down. And then I'm going into bending and flexing the knee when I'm capable of it and focusing on breathing, ideally breathing through that diaphragm. So focusing on breathing through the diaphragm to relax your body as quick as humanly possible. And now we've gotten basically the inside of the leg, we've gotten the quads, we've gotten the hip flexor itself, we've gotten the TFL itself. Now it's time for us to get the glutes a little bit as well. Even though we're gonna be strengthening those, we want them to be mobile and capable enough to firing the way that we want. So I'm gonna do this with just grabbing a seat on my foam roller. You can do this with a ball as well. It's a lot more acute. Um, and what I'm gonna do, you can either just 
pivot yourself to one side and roll out that glute. That might be intense enough for some of you guys. And we're exploring anything even from the outside of the butt all the way to kind of the lower back area. So you might find that you it's easy enough for you to get a knot that way, or you can cross your leg up and do the same thing, kind of tilting a little bit more to the side or tilting a little bit more upright. It just depends. You're exploring, trying to find any knotted up tissue, then you're sitting on it breathing and you can use your other hand when you're ready to bend and flex the knee or if you are down to kind of uh, open up and close the hip and that will allow you to explore um, releasing that knot while moving as well. So all of these things are great techniques to not release. You can do a couple of extra stretches like my favorite stretches are where you are doing a kneeling hip flexor stretch. So this is involved with knee down on the ground. Actually, I'm going to use my pad right here for my knee. And getting yourself dead straight ahead, you want to engage the back glute by flexing that glute, getting yourself into a little bit of a hip tuck, and then angling yourself forward until you feel a stretch come across the front of your hip flexor. I have something just to the outside of me to help me balance. You guys can do the same next to a wall. And at about the 20 second mark, I want to get a little bit deeper into this where I'm going to take a nice deep breath in on the exhale, swing my arms straight up. I'll feel a little bit of an increased tension there and then take another deep breath in and on the exhale, pivot over the front knee. So that little motion now, I'm going to feel a really deep hip flexor stretch. After I've held that for a little bit of time, I can either switch legs and go to the other side or I can relax the upper body, still keeping the same tension on the hip and then go into a raise up and more of a lateral bend. This now I'm going to feel all the way from kind of the intercostal muscles down to the obliques and down to that TFL. It's the outside of the hip that we stretched out. And then finally, we're gonna do uh, a couch stretch where we kick this back leg up. So we are bending the back foot up toward the butt still keeping the same tension with the glute being flexed and thrusting forward just a little bit, keeping an upright torso. And now I'm going to feel a really deep quad stretch, assuming you're able to do this. If this is really aggressive on the ground, you might want to try this with a literal couch. Um, it's called the couch stretch because you can basically recreate this where if your couch is positioned um, behind you, you can place your knee directly into the corner of the couch, resting your leg up against the cushion, and then just kind of stand yourself upright and your knee will be propped up naturally by the couch and it's a little bit easier to take ten put more tension into it or take a little bit of tension out of it so if your knee can't take it that might be an alternative if you're not able to do that just going into a standard quad stretch can be great if you're in that state um, if you're at that stage of recovery i should say so now we've mobilized ourselves through some knot releases We've also taken the time to stretch out and increase our flexibility. It's time to activate the muscle groups that are weak when we are collapsing in with that knee valgus. So I'm gonna use a resistance band here. And I talked a little bit about last week how, actually I think it was in week uh, one for this topic, where you can do clamshells to get your glute medius. That is an option for you, but I want this to be a little bit more practical to what we do when we're actually jumping or cutting or skiing or playing tennis or playing volleyball or whatever it might be. So I wanna do some stuff more upright and on my feet because that's how your body is moving when you're playing your sports. So we're going to start with doing some lateral band walks. Many of you guys that have gone through rehab have done this, where you're taking steps out to the side with a nice little bend in your knees and engagement of your core. The biggest key though, that I see so many people miss, and unfortunately physical therapists don't always have a keen enough eye to point this out for their patients, is as you step, you're not allowed to turn your toes out to the side at all. You have to keep your foot dead straight ahead with each step. It's almost um, better to err on the side of being pigeon-toed as you walk, because as you step this way, it comes. the tension comes from the TFL. As you step dead sideways, the tension's coming from the glutes, and that also involves the trail leg. You don't want to let this foot turn out to the side as you're taking your steps. Even slight angles, make a difference. So you wanna make sure that you are incredibly 
um, religious about keeping your feet straight. The other thing you can do is monster walks. So monster walks is you have this slight bend, you're just walking forward and walking backwards, keeping everything dead straight in alignment. You're naturally keeping the knees from caving inward and you're training those glute mediuses to fire while you're walking or in this position, you're kind of in this half squat. It's the preliminary phase to if you are about to jump. And then assisted squats or modified squats are a great thing. We're gonna cover this a little bit more next week as well, but using something like a door frame or a TRX strap or holding on to super bands that are kind of connected at chest height or above, or just body weight, you can do assisted squats where as you squat down, you're literally pushing the knees out, focusing on engaging the hips, keeping the feet straight. If you remember last week, we talked about trying to screw those feet into the ground so we pop your arches back into place. So we don't want the kneecaps caving inward. We want them in line with the mid to outside of the foot. As you squat again, those knees are in line with the mid to outside of the foot. And this is, again, this band is very subtle, but it's proprioceptively training your glutes to fire and stabilize that knee into alignment while you're doing your movements. This is one of the main things that caused me to be able to rehabilitate my MCL and meniscus, as well as being able to prevent future patella pain um, as I progress further into my sports. And now my knee is totally back to 100%. Same thing went for Robert. This is how Claire, one of the main things that allowed Claire to get recruited by all the colleges that she did and, and now play for Princeton. So um, these are some great techniques to start. There's a ton more we could give you. Um, oh, actually, I take it back. There's one more that I did want to give you, which still using this resistance band is going into a glute bridge because I want to also train the glute maximus, the big butt, to be firing because like I said, those of us that have gone through um, knee injury rehab often have overactive quads. So that means the glutes and the hamstrings aren't firing correctly. So if we go into glute bridges where we have that resistance band trying to pull our knees in and we're fighting that tension, pull the toes up so this is engaging the anterior tibialis, those that um, lack of dorsiflexion that we tested last week. Now we can go into a glute bridge firing not only the glute maximus, we're also firing the glute minimus, uh, medius I should say, the outside, and we are engaging those front of shin, the anterior tibialis muscles, to keep everything into alignment. This is just a good wake up call for the glutes and the um, ankles even as well. So these are some basic exercises. There's a lot of variations to the glute bridge. For instance, you could do the same thing in a single leg format where you have one leg down, the other leg off to the side, and you go through the same thing into a single leg glute bridge, trying to fight, making sure that this leg doesn't collapse in with the pull of your um, with the off leg, with the high leg, you can come up to the top, hold it, and bring this knee in and out, training the plant leg to stay stable and fire the way that it should. All of these are some basic techniques that you can do, and there's a lot more intense variations that we incorporate with our patients and with our clients in the Health by Ratio program, but hopefully this gets you guys going into retraining those hips and making sure that we are correcting that knee valgus. If you guys have any questions on this or want some more one-on-one -on -one help, feel free always to book a call with us. We'd love to speak with you. Um, and outside of that, we'll talk to you guys next week and go over the proprioceptive exercises you can do to fully retrain your body, along with a few not so common rehabilitation techniques to reduce swelling.